this week's training for the 70-461 certification series. Uh, this week we're going to cover cursors and string functions. Uh, and this is being presented by myself, Steve Stedman, and by Aaron Buma. Uh, for all those joining us remotely, uh, for any questions that come up via Google On Air broadcast, we'll address most of those at the end, uh, unless it's a question that's appropriate uh, to deal with as we as we get into it, in which we could take it as we go through the broadcast. Uh, training is provided by Emergency Reporting. I just need to put in a plug for Emergency Reporting because they're paying us to do this and to share it with the world. So if you want to find out more about Emergency Reporting, visit emergencyreporting.com. And slides and sample code are available right now for download on this session. Uh, if you want to follow along, uh, they're available at stevestedman.com. And I just want to welcome viewers from all over the world, a uh, number of them from the United States, uh, as well as international locations. Uh, the list continues to grow a little bit every week. So uh, part of how we're judging the success of this is not just what people learn, but how many people we get from uh, participating. So please, uh, for next week's presentation, share it with everyone you know, so we can get as many people to show up for the training as we can. Uh, just a note on the Google On Air broadcast, there is about a 40 to 50 second delay from when we do something or say something on uh, our end here to what you see. Uh, so uh, we're, we're still working with that and still learning. So when you ask a question, it'll be delayed about 40 to 50 seconds before we actually see it. So uh, just be patient if you don't get a response immediately. And then the sessions will be available afterwards on my YouTube channel uh, at stevesteadman.com slash YouTube. And we are still learning, so be patient with us. Uh, we get a little bit better at this every week, I hope, uh, but we'll keep improving. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can use the uh, question and answer panel on the Google On Air Hangout. There's a little three by three grid icon on the top, top right area of the, the black screen. Uh, and you can click that to see the question and answer section. All right, so next I wanna congratulate Aaron. Uh, Aaron, who's helping teach, uh, he took and passed the SQL Query 70-461 certification exam last Friday. So awesome job, Aaron. And as the rest of you go through this and eventually get to the point of taking it, I wanna be able to congratulate every one of you. Uh, it's a really good feeling to finish that exam. Uh, so if others who are watching remotely get to the point that you take the exam and you pass, please email me or get a hold of me uh, and let me know because I'd love to be able to congratulate you at this point too. So on to this week's training. This week we're going to cover uh, two main topics. The first one will be cursors and how to use cursors, what they are, how to work with them, pros and cons, things like that. Uh, I will be doing the training on that one. And then we'll cover some string functions. Uh, and that'll be string functions in T-SQL, uh, as well as some new functions that have been introduced in SQL Server 2012. So, uh, and Aaron will be covering that half of it. On to cursors. So cursors are a method for iterating over a result set in T-SQL. And it's basically the, a way of taking your results one row at a time. And really what most of the time when you're writing T-SQL code, whether, whether you're working with just SSMS, writing a query, or you're putting in a stored procedure, or you're working in a function or wherever it may be, usually you're just writing T-SQL code that does things as a batch. You're gonna do a join, or you're gonna do multiple joins and pull data together. But with cursors, what it does is it allows you to take those results and in T-SQL, loop through that result set. Kind of like how you'd loop through a result set if you were processing through in code. Uh, now, there's some things, or pros and cons around this that we'll get into, but keep in mind that SQL Server is designed to work really well with big sets of data and to bring massive sets of data together and join them and get your results that way. And when you change to iterating over those result sets one row at a time, you're really taking away the power of SQL Server uh, and you can run into some serious performance issues there. Uh, my recommendation is generally stay away from cursors unless you don't have any other option for what you're trying to do. And maybe you should go talk to two or three people and see if there's another option before you go with that because you can get some pretty bad performance out of them. But given that, there are some reasons where uh, a cursor is a really great way to work. So let's take a look at what a cursor is. Uh, the way a cursor works in SQL Server is you start out by declaring some variable and you as type cursor. You then set the cursor equal to a cursor for a specific query. And in this case, I'm going to be using the, uh, using the sales.store 
uh, table in the AdventureWorks database, which if you're not familiar with AdventureWorks, it's a free database that Microsoft puts out that you can download for samples. There's a lot of sample code based around that one. Uh, here I'm going to select the top 50, and what the cursor is going to do is it's going to be associated with this query. But at the point we allocate the cursor, it's not actually running the query at this point. It's just saying, here's the query that's going to be run. Then we open the cursor, and that's the point that it actually goes and brings in the data from all the tables and starts processing. But keep in mind at this point, that's there's a, uh, the locks that are taken when you're pulling data or updating data or whatever they may be, they're started at this point and they're kept open. So that's where you run into some of the performance issues. So we open the cursor and then we say, fetch next, or give me, given that we're at the very beginning of it, give me the very first item uh, back from that result set. And we're going to put it into these variables called business entity ID and business name, which I didn't include the declarations of those, but those would be declared as uh, an integer and a var char. Now, once we've got the first one back, we then go into a loop, like what you run into a lot, uh, like a for loop or a while loop, where we're just gonna keep pulling from this cursor and doing something with it as, uh, as long as there's results there. And the way that we tell if there's results is there's this global variable associated with the, with the fetch status of the current cursor that's at at fetch status. And as long as that equals zero, that tells us that there's more data available. As soon as it's not zero, uh, we're at the end of the result set or there's no more data we can get. Uh, so then inside of the while loop, I'm just using the print command to print out the result sets. Uh, here we're gonna print out the business entity ID and the business name, and I'm just gonna cast that to a var char and concatenate them together there. Uh, now, you could do other stuff like that, like you could run an update statement there or run another select statement based off of something or go run a stored procedure based off the values that are being put into that result as it's looping through this. And then at the bottom of the loop, I'm just gonna use that same fetch next command that I used earlier and say, give me the next result set there. Or, or give me the next row in the result set. So each time through, it just fills out this business entity ID and business name variable with whatever was returned from the column specified uh, in business entity ID and name up here in our original select statement. Now, as with any, any programming language where you don't have automatic garbage collection, there's things you have to do at the end to clean up. Otherwise, your cursors get left open or left hanging and you're uh, wasting additional resources at that. So at the point you close the cursor, that's going to go and clean up any open connections that are there in regard to looping through uh, the result set. Now you might say, well, why doesn't it just do that automatically when I fetch the very last item in that result set? Well, with cursors, although you only see fetch next on this slide, you can fetch prior and go forwards and backwards through the result set. Um, so it doesn't actually close that cursor until you uh, call the close command. And then the deallocate, that just uh, releases the memory that's been associated with, with that item. Now, if you're doing this in SQL Server Management Studio and you forget those two, but you just close the editing tab that you've got open, it will clean those up for you at that point because your session's been terminated. But it's good practice to make sure you always close and deallocate that cursor because uh, then when you're doing it in a stored procedure or something, uh, you'll never forget to do it. Whoops, scroll back a little bit there. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at some actual code here. So here's the sample for the cursors. Uh, we're going to be using the AdventureWorks database. And let's just take a look at the sales.store table real quick. So what we've got in the sales.store is a bunch of stuff, but these are a bunch of different different stores. And uh, it might be stores that the company works with or vendors or different places that they provide to, but either way, it's just a list here that has an ID and a name. Now, if we wanna look at that on how we would use a cursor, what we're going to do is go through, similar to what we did on the slide a moment ago, uh, but the one I missed was declaring the variables that uh, the results are gonna go into. We declare the cursor, we associate the cursor with our query, 
we open it, we fetch the first res result, and then as a while loop, we go through and it's just gonna print out to our results window, uh, one for each row, and then we close the cursor. So we highlight all of that and run it. And you see what we get is some output here that uh, is just one row being printed out for each of the results in that query. Now, you might look and say, well, I could have just done that by sending the results out to uh, the text window. But what this is allowing you to do is instead of putting in a print statement here, it's where you could perform other actions based off the results there. Maybe you want to do some calculations, some math based off of it, or an update statement, or something else. Uh, but that's just the way you can loop through the result set. Now, let's take a look next at SP Describe Cursor. Now, in SQL Server, you've got a bunch of built-in stored procedures that all start out with SP. Uh, and what this does is it allows you to get detailed information about your cursor. Uh, I could have put more on the slide, but it's a lot easier just to show what it's going to do. So here we're going to have a cursor called last name cursor. And it's going to iterate uh, over, it's just going to be select last name from person dot person. And you notice how we put the declare and the allocation on the same line here, in the same group here. Uh, it's going to iterate over all of the people in the table called person dot person and show their last name. We're going to open the cursor. But then here's where we're going to do something different. I'm going to declare a second cursor called at report. And then I'm going to execute master.dbo.sp describe cursor with some parameters here. And it's what it's going to do is look at our glo look globally and find and fill in this cursor with a result set that describes this last name cursor, which was allocated up here. And then it's going to print out the results based off of whatever, or it's going to fetch the next from the report. Uh, and that ends up displaying uh, the specific results that tell us information about that cursor. And you might be thinking, well, this is a little bit weird. So let's just run it and see what that does. So when we run it, what we get back is we get two result sets. Now, it could be if you ran this with the right parameters, you might be able to see to go and find out how many cursors you have open in your current session or uh, how many levels deep are we nested in cursors, perhaps. But this gives you some information. And here, uh, it's giving us the name of the cursor, cursor scope, status, and a bunch of things here that you may not know exactly what they mean. So what we do is I've included a link here to the books online example. I'll open that up, and you can see, for instance, the cursor's returned. If we look at the results set, uh, cursor scope of two. Two means it's global versus local. And you can scroll through and find out what all the different meanings of those things are here. Uh, but as we go through, you see things like fetch status of minus nine. And I know minus nine. Look over here refers to uh, there's nothing that's been there's no been no fetch returned yet. So if I had opened up the cursor and actually fetched a row before calling this function, it would have had different results here. And then you can see like how many rows are being processed in that cursor without having to iterate through the whole thing uh, and details about it. Questions come up, Mark? Um, is it a global cursor because it was declared static or because we haven't closed it? It's because, not because it was declared static. Static, and I should have covered that when we hit that. Static means let's effectively just sort of make a copy of this data, and it's not going to change if the data behind it is attempted to be changed while we're processing through. But it's global because we didn't actually declare it as being local. Oh, okay. we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a minute, but that's a really good question. And then there's a second result set here that comes back with nothing, sort of signifying that it's done at this point. But uh, we can go in and get information and find out things like how many rows do we have to process. That'd be kind of nice uh, if you're going to loop through some amount of rows in a cursor to know how many rows are there before jumping in and trying to use it. All right, so next, we're going to take a look at a forward-only cursor. Now, I mentioned there's a lot of performance issues around cursors, and a lot of that comes down to people not understanding uh, how to use a cursor correctly. 
see it. Are there questions no, over here? It's about scripts. And okay. Videos. Got it. So uh, there's some things you can do when you're now. There's performance issues with a cursor, and there's some things you can do to help your cursor go faster. And one of those is using a forward-only cursor. Uh, but forward-only specifies as you're scanning through the result set, you can only go forward. I mean, it's kind of clear from the name. Hopefully, for everyone, that that's what it means. But it's faster than some of the other options. So let's take a look at some code around that. Question? So I noticed when you did when you're defining your earlier cursor, you did four. Can you short circuit the forward only to just be four? Was, is that what that was? Uh, no, no. The, the the like right here where you use the word four. Yeah. That is not an abbreviation of okay. forward only. Okay. That's what you're was, asking, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the four, the syntax is it's a cursor okay. for this query. Okay. So first, let's take a look at an example without the forward only here. And in this example, we've got first, middle, last, and phone number on names, and we're going to go through peop a people list, and we're going to get back from this list of people the first 10 of them, just to make it a little bit quicker as we're looking at it. Uh, and then it's going to concatenate uh, all of them together. And because some of them may be null, we're wrapping them as, in as null uh, just for safety. And then it's going to print out that result, one row for each person in the table. So let's take a look first at running that as the default without the forward only. So when we run this, okay, we get a list of 10 people here and their phone number, as you might expect. Now let's take a look at the forward only version. And there's links to some examples on my website here as well. But we're going to run the forward only. And the thing I've done different is right here, where we declare the cursor, I've specified it as being forward underscore only so that it's we're taking away the ability to step backwards or to jump to the end and then come backwards from that. And what this does, it ends up improving the performance quite a bit. So let's first we'll just run the run the cursor. Yeah, we get the same results that we did when we looked at it a moment ago. But let's scroll back up here and highlight both of them, the original one and the forward only. I'm going to hit control M which turns on the actual execution plan. I'm going to execute it. And we get our two result sets. They kind of blended together here because uh, I didn't put anything in to delimit them. But when we look at the execution plan, we can see when we declare the first cursor, that takes about 5% of our time. And then as we scroll through here, each time it takes, each time we fetch next from that cursor, it takes about 4% of our time, 4% of the entire batch that was run there. And I shouldn't say time. Time is the wrong way to say it. It takes about 4% of the cost or the work involved in processing all those queries, which oftentimes works out to time, but it's not quite accurate. So as we go through here, there's going to be 10 plus one extra one where it terminates uh, 11 times that it's going to take 4% of the time to get through the batch. Okay, then we hit the point where we open the second cursor. And it takes 5% of the time. And if you remember, it took 5% of the time to open the first cursor. So whether it's a forward only or a cursor that you can scroll back and forth in it, it takes the same amount of time to open it. But where, where we see here is with the forward only, it's still taking 4% of the time. So the forward only in this case isn't that much better performing based off the specific set of data we're looking at. However, if we were looking at a larger set of data, we may be some, seeing some performance gains here. And that's one of the common mistakes that people make when they start working with cursors is they assume, oh, I'll, I'll just use forward only. That'll make things faster. Well, it is faster than some of the other options. But what you really want to use if you want to use a fast cursor, or if you want your cursor to be fast, is this parameter called fast forward, which is not just forward only. But it's got some optimizing things in there that I don't truly understand that allow it to run quite a bit faster. Uh, it's also a forward only cursor. And usually this is where I start with. Because normally when I'm working with it, if I have to use a cursor, I'm only going to be going forward. And this speeds, speeds things up quite a bit. So let's take a look now at a comparison between our forward only cursor, which we saw perform similar, and our fast forward cursor, which right here at this point, where we've changed forward only to the word fast forward. We're going to run both of those together. Same results as we saw before. 
but the initial one took 8% and then 6% of the batch for each, each row processed. And the 6% gets repeated 10 times, so we have 10 rows. Now when we hit the second cursor, it takes 8% of the batch. And then each time iterating through with the fetch next, it only takes 1% of the batch. You work the math, math out on this, and uh, it's almost four times as much time to process with the forward only or not specifying the type uh, versus the fast forward cursor. And the default is forward? No, the default is, so the question is the default forward. The default is uh, effectively scrollable. You can go forward, you can go backwards. The default is about as slow as you can get. And that's why when people first learn cursors and they don't know about forward only or fast forward, they go with the defaults and you end up with this about the slowest possible cursor you could do. So oftentimes uh, when I'm looking at code, I'm looking maybe at a stored proc that somebody wrote and there's a couple of cursors in it. Uh, usually you can fix them up just by adding fast forward to improve the performance. But oftentimes, or most of the time, you should look at it and say, how can I replace that with something that's not a cursor, with a join or a CTE or maybe a temp table or something else. There's lots of different ways to do things that can be uh, much more performant than using the cursor. Okay, so let's take a look now at a static read-only, forward-only cursor. So there's a lot of terms in there. Local, static, read-only, forward-only. Okay, local says it's confined to the scope of just this, uh, this uh, statement that, or the query area that we're in. If we're in a stored procedure, it's confined to that stored procedure. If we're in a T-SQL session like this in SSMS, it's confined to the last go statement. Then we have static, which says, don't change this even if the data changes on me. Then read-only says, I'm not going to be doing any update statements on any of the, the table that's in here, and it's going to be forward-only. So if we take a look at that, and now compare it to the fast forward. Again, we get the same results out of both of them that we saw before. We look at the plans. The fast forward took 21% of the time and then 3% to iterate over each item. And then when we open Okay, so backing up here, the fast forward took 21% to start it and then 3% over each one. When we open the second cursor, it took 21% and then 3% through each time. So even using all those extra parameters where you're trying to say, let's get really cool with all the stuff we're doing here to try and make it as fast as we can, it really doesn't perform any better than the fast forward cursor does. So next, let's take a look at a scrolling cursor. Okay, scrolling implies that we can go in both directions with uh, scanning through it. We can go up, we can go down, we can change it around whenever we want. Uh, and the values that you get with it are uh, fetch first, fetch last, fetch prior, fetch next, fetch relative, and fetch absolute. So relative will give you, based on the current row, we can jump three ahead or wherever it may be. Absolute will say jump immediately to row 700 if we use 700. Uh, first and last means we start at the beginning of the result set. Last means we start at the end. Prior goes backwards, next goes forwards. Kind of straightforward there, I hope. Uh, so let's take a look at an example of that. The way we're going to do this is we're using that same people phone cursor. We're fetching in the same variables. But when we start out, we're going to fetch next. And then generally, we're going to fetch next. But every five, we're going to jump back one. So if the counter mod five equals zero, so every five times through the loop, we're going to jump back one. Uh, just a way of looking at how we can do fetch prior and fetch next in the same query. Uh, and then when we run the results here, oops, highlight too much. Uh, you can see it goes through here, Ken, Terry, Robert, Rob, Gail, Rob, Gail. And as we hit five, one, two, three, four, five, Gail was number five. Let me zoom in on that little bit. Gale was number five, so it jumped back to Rob, and then it hit Gale again and continued on uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Diane is ten. It pops back to Dylan. We see Dylan here and Diane, and it continues on that way. So it shows that you're able to, in a given cursor, 
go forwards and backwards uh, depending on what you're searching for. Now, it could be that uh, you're trying to implement, I don't know, let's say you're trying to create some kind of uh, searching algorithm where you want to jump to the middle and then based off the result, you're going to jump back and or however you want to do it. Uh, you could, you, you, yeah, you could effectively do a binary search this way if, I mean, it'd be maybe a crazy thing to do in SQL Server because SQL's got such great ways for searching. But if you really had to do a search for something this way, uh, maybe that would be the way to do it. Okay, so a little bit more on scrolling here. Uh, here's an example where we're going to use the same thing. We're going to fetch next and keep fetching next. Uh, but what I want to do is compare that. Oh, so. That's our basic one where we're gonna, where we normally, even though it's a scrollable one, we are only iterating through this forward only, and we get our results going forward. But because we haven't, we specified scroll here, instead of fast forward, it's gonna be a slower way to do that fast forward type cursor. But now if we take that same query and we change a couple of words, we change the word next, or first to last right here, and we change the word next to prior, we're able to open that result set and run through it in reverse order. So it's still, because the query is specifying top 10, it's still only looking at the first 10 out of the result set, but it's iterating over them in the reverse order. Now there's lots of ways you could probably do the same thing uh, without using a scrollable cursor, like changing the order of the results, like with an order by. Uh, However, uh, it's just showing you all the different things a cursor can do. And given that we're trying to do the training here so that we can do everything we need to do for the 70-461 exam, you need to know about cursors, how they work, what they do, how to go forwards, how to go backwards, all the different parameters there. Uh, but I, don't rec I, I recommend not using them unless you don't have any other option. So performance issues. Cursors are generally not as performant as set logic. There's almost always a better way, and nested cursors become horrible because you end up with a lot more blocking issues and uh, looping inside of another loop inside of another loop really just slows down overall performance. There's been places where I've seen that, that there's a stored procedure, for instance, that, that runs really slow. I know you've seen some of these, Aaron, where you go to look at, well, why is the query so darn slow? Well, there's a cursor at the top level in the first stored procedure that calls another stored procedure. There's another cursor in that, which calls another stored procedure, and there's another cursor inside of that. And you get three or four cursors deep, uh, and then there's just you just have to rewrite it all if you want it to run faster. There's no way to, I and mean, you can put the fa uh, fast forward on there, but when you're in that kind of an issue, it generally doesn't help enough. All right, so let's look a little bit more at performance here. So. And this is one of those things that, and I, and I don't mean to speak badly of developers this way, but as developers, you guys know how to program in the constructs that are given in programming languages you're used to. You're used to for loops, you're used to while loops, you're used to do whiles, you're used to for each, those kind of things. And you're really good at them because those are the tools that are available in whatever language you're working in that allow you to do these kind of things. But in SQL Server, and, and the mistake that's often made is, well, I know how to do this in C sharp or whatever it may be, and I'm just going to take my same logic and do a while loop that says what I want to do is update all of these employees here in this example, and for everyone that's got an employee ID of less than 100, they're going to be awarded 80 extra hours or two weeks of extra vacation time. And a, a completely logical way based off of typical programming style is to say, well, let's just do a while loop and we'll update every one of those and you increment your loop as you go through it. And if you were coding this in some non-transact SQL way of doing it, uh, yeah, this might be the way you have to do it. But let's take a look here. We're gonna use statistics IO and a couple of other things. And when we look at this, we're going to run that query. We're first gonna select out of the table, run the query 100 times as it goes through the loop, and then look at the results afterwards. So you can see when we run it, uh, the before value for business for the entity of one is 99. It's now added 80 to 179. For two, it's one, and it added 80. It's now 171. But it took us four seconds to run. Now, if I was to take off the 
100 on the loop here and I had to do this for 1,000 or 10,000 items, it would literally take all day to run. Now, again, that's not exactly a cursor, but it's simulating kind of the difference between looping and uh, doing it as a set based. Now, if we look at the plan or the statistics I.O., you can see that every time we run those update statements, we see we get logical reads of nine and then two and then 100 times through, it's doing two reads for each one and then it finishes out with nine at the end as it displays the entire list. But if we were to do that differently, where I run my rollback to put it back to the original state here, and we were to do the same thing with a single update statement rather than looping, the whole thing happens in far less than a second. We get 9 plus 5 plus 9 or a total of 23 logical reads versus well over 200 logical reads in the other example. And we're doing the exact same amount of work with a lot less looping there. Now let's take another example here of, and I, oh, and I should introduce the term here, rebar, as it's pronounced. Uh, row by agonizing row. Uh, what that means is you're taking a system like SQL Server that's designed to process massive sets of data with joins and other logic, like you do with queries all the time, and you're throwing out all of that logic and saying, let's just go one row at a time. Let's not do what you know how to do really well as, as, as a database, and let's just try and iterate over it one, one at a time. And that's why you get the term row by agonizing, and agonizing usually, usually refers to how long it takes to process it, row by agonizing row. So here's an example using a cursor of looking at row by agonizing row versus a set. So in here, what we're going to do is pretend that our company, AdventureWorks.com, was purchased by BigCorporation.com, and everyone's email is changing. So what the job is, is to go in and find, and we're only going to do the top 50 because this is really too slow to do it for any more than that. We're going to find, uh, we're going to go through and replace the top 50 adventureworks.com with email addresses with big, uh, bigcorporation.com. I'll cover what replaces. What's that? I'm going to cover what replaces. Okay, so Aaron's going to cover the replace function uh, in the second half of the training today. But we're going to loop through this employee table. We're going to do updates on it. Uh, and let's take a look at what it takes for that to run. And at this point, I asked, does anybody need coffee, uh, restroom break, whatever, because this, this runs for a while. OK, it doesn't run for that long. But you can see it took about seven seconds down here for it to run. And as it's going through, it's doing all kinds of reads over and over again uh, on a work table and employee. And there's a whole lot of work going on here. Now, if we look at the exact same thing, we could, we could have done that whole thing in an update statement. Oops. Wrong. Wrong key. OK. We could have done that whole thing in this update statement. I guess the zoom's not so good there because uh, we don't see it all. Where we just said update this, set the email address equal to that, where the business ID is in selecting this list. And there's another way we could do it. Instead of using the in clause, we could have done an inner join to get the same set of people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run both of these. Remember the first well, first version we did looping took seven seconds to run. When we run this, both of them run in under a second. And if you look at the scan count, although the scan count is 290, which is kind of high here, and the reads are, are quite high, what's happening is as it's going through this, it pulls it into memory, and it's reading the same memory over and over again. So it's really fast to update those 290 rows rather than going through and doing them one row at a time. So when you hear the term R bar or rebar, that refers to uh, row by agonizing row. And here's another example of how we could do that with a cursor. We declare the cursor. Uh, what's the difference with this one? Yep. Question mark? Is the join generally faster than the end? There's I noticed a, they look about the same there, but yep. I've heard before that end is slower usually. So it, it depends. It, the question was between these two queries, is the join faster than the end? And the, the best answer for that is it depends. There are cases uh, where doing a join is going to be much more performant, depending on the size of the tables and what you may be doing. 
Uh, there's times where the end will be more performant. Uh, and to, to just blatantly or just to, to state that one is always faster than the other is not true. Now, in older versions of SQL Server, the in clause didn't perform so well compared to this. So maybe on like SQL Server 2000, uh, there, there would have been a significant difference between these. But uh, you really want to look at it uh, and look at the plan and see what's going on in both of them. And in this case, they're almost identical. In fact, they are identical uh, to the number of page reads that it hits. OK, so here's another example of updating. I don't know why we've got the email address in there twice. We'll skip over that one. Uh, but we'll take a look at another example here of using a cursor. And this is one that's uh, that's probably an, an interesting re way to use a cursor. Uh, it's not easy to just throw it out into some set-based logic. But what we're going to do is we're going to query sys.databases. And what that does is it gives us a list of what are the databases on our current server. OK, well, we can see we've got master, tempdb, model, msdb, query training, and adventure works. Not a lot of databases here. But let's say we want to perform an action on each one of those databases. And in this case, I'm going to create a cursor that pulls back the name and the database ID. It loops on that. It prints it out. It then sets a variable for backup file. And it then runs backup to disk. And before doing this, I want to make sure I built this demo on another computer. Don't have database backups there. So I'm going to create a new folder called database backups so that this will run correctly. Now, because I'm running SQL Server on the local machine here, I'm able to back up to the C drive. If I was running against a remote server, uh, I would have needed to create that directory on the C drive of that server, not on the computer I'm connecting from. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to go through and back up all of our databases inside of a cursor looping. When it runs, you can see we, we're getting output. I want it completed with some errors. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. It should have it should have excluded tempdb in there because tempdb is not something that should really be or that you're allowed to back up because uh, it's temp data that's changing and restoring it would give you no benefit. So if I just uh, change this cursor to say uh, where oops, where name doesn't equal tempdb, then uh, that would have run just fine. It, but so this is a way that you can run through uh, running backups or multiple things based off of a cursor. Now, based off of SQL Server documentation, that's kind of probably one of the optimal ways to do that uh, if you didn't want to have a hard-coded list of backups. But if you go out and look at the undocumented SQL Server commands, and this is not one that you you'll probably be asked about on any kind of exam because it's not documented, but there's this stored procedure called MS for each DB or SPMS for each DB. It's an undocumented command. And what it says is, take this set of SQL that we're going to pass in and run it once for every database on the system. So when we run this, it's shorter and a lot cleaner than doing it as a cursor. And we get similar output and a similar error on tempdb. Uh, and we get all of our backups performed. And if we go look at disk, there's all the backups that were just run based off of that. So one of the things I stress is generally when you're using a cursor, there's some other way of doing it. Not always, but most of the time there will be. And try and understand what that other way of doing it is. Google, search, see what you can do to figure out an alternative to cursors. But to take the exam, know how cursors work and be able to work with them. All right, so next, there's a time and the place for cursors. Uh, just like any tool, uh, you can use it incorrectly. And there are just few few cases where it's really a good place to use a cursor. Now, an example that I've got here, uh, I currently have running on my home computer, and it's been running for about uh, two and a half weeks now, uh, a T-SQL job that I built to calculate prime numbers. And when I started out, I was using set logic, some CTEs, doing some joins and all that to calculate primes. And that worked great for about, well, great. It started slowing down, but it worked fairly good 
for about the first 100 million prime numbers that I calculated. Now, I think there was a term that Gabe used this week, the quintessential database geek or something like that. How, how could I live up to that without having some kind of job like this that runs for weeks to go generate prime numbers? But, uh, and it was based off of some interview questions that we asked, and I thought, well, how can we do this in T-SQL? So it got to the point that I was generating about, I don't know, it started out where I was generating hundreds of prime numbers a second, and then it slowed down to the point that it was hundreds per minute, and then uh, using set logic after about 100,000 numbers, it became really slow, and the point that it would never go very far. Uh, I changed that to a cursor process uh, that does batches at a time. So it takes, fills up a temp table, goes through, uses a cursor to iterate over the result sets, and does calculations that way. And that gave me about a hundredfold increase on my processing power, uh, on, on my processing time to calculate those prime numbers. And as of the time I wrote this yesterday, I'm about 753 million prime numbers that have been calculated using that cursor now. So uh, fun project I've been running. Uh, and again, this is one of those things where I was running it as a virtual machine in a server with eight gigs of RAM and uh, just sharing part of the processor of my home computer with Hyper-V and all that. So it wasn't like it was a super high powered uh, database, but because of the constraints of memory and processor and all that, I was able to get something done with a cursor that I wasn't able to do very well in any other way that I could figure out. However, that's one of the rare times that I have come up with a solution that a cursor is the right way to do it. Oh, and we've already been through all the demo code here. I'm sure we didn't miss any. All right, next, on to string functions with Aaron. All right, string functions. <clears throat> Just start into it. Uh, first one, pretty basic and kind of self-explanatory, uh, is the, the length function, len. And that returns the length of um, whatever column or value you have in the parentheses. I'm going to go through all of the string function first and then go into slides, or sorry, uh, scripts, describe, demoing each of them. Uh, for sections of string, we have left, right, and substring. Uh, left and right requires two parameters, uh, what you want to kind of splice up, and then the second parameter is how much you want to splice up. So left will return the left, in this example, left four of the description column. Right will return the uh, right five. Uh, and substring has three parameters. The first one is what you want to uh, splice up. Second parameter is the starting position, uh, where 0 or 1 is the first character. It's kind of tricky there. Uh, and then the, the last parameter is uh, how far you want to, uh, how many characters you want to take. Uh, then we uh, move on to changing strings, L trim and right trim. R trim, remove leading or trailing spaces from uh, either side. Upper and lower, convert the whole string to upper or lower. <clears throat> and replace, as we saw, uh, will take uh, the, the first parameter is kind of your haystack of what you want to look through. The second parameter is what you're looking for. And the third parameter is what you want to replace it with. And then we'll move on to 2012 string functions. Uh, concat kind of makes concatenating fields much easier. Uh, it's instead of doing the is null, and then you know you have your your string, and then a tick tick, and then a plus, and then your next one. Uh, you can just use the concat function to just pop them all in there, as we'll see, and it will take care of your is nulls for you. Uh, <clears throat> and then the, uh, the there's a format function, and it's an easy way in 2012 to format dates with localization, uh, currency with localization as well, time, and uh, numbers with custom formatting. <clears throat> and if we can get to it, we'll uh, discuss server property function, an object property function, 
and with the object property we can check the is ms shipped function to see if it was if it's a custom function or sorry custom object or if it came with SQL server On the demos, we're going to use the uh, inventory database, uh, which just has one table this time, just an inventory table uh, with some items, item skew, and quantities and prices. So the uh, the length function, you can see, uh, len here. Uh, I have a, a length function on the description column. We can see that this this first row here, sleeping bags, has a length of 26. Sleeping bag with green has a length of 28. Uh, 20 for this camo tent, 21 for a black axe. What if you encounter nulls? You run that, you get a length of null back because null doesn't uh, isn't really anything. You can't have a length of nothing. Uh, if it's if it's tick tick, you get a length of zero. But nulls itself it returns a length of, of null. So if you have rows in in your column set that you're running the length on, you might want to put a is null tick tick on there. If you know that there's nulls in there and you want to count those as em being empty. Okay, right. uh, under the sections of string. So again, we select the, we're going to perform everything on the description column. Uh, the left four is this, this one. So it returns S L E E because we select, we wanted the left four. Out of the description and the tent for this row, and so on. Uh, the next column is the right string function. We selected the right five, so we can see it. It moves to the the end of the string and works backwards. So we can see we have tick or, uh, dash space red, the entire green word, um, camel space camel. Uh, and then, does oh. it look like as well? Like what happened to the left? We're using a left to right. There, right they don't include like any localization in there. So, it, it, the question was, do those fun string functions include localization with them? And no, they do not. They just look at the characters and return what you uh, want to select out from them or trim off of them. But also, just to note on that, if you use an n bar char <laughs> instead of a bar char. It will return that number of items, that number of characters, not that number of bytes, for instance. Correct. So if it was an n bar char, you'd get the right number of characters back. Yeah. So if if in this left function here, if it was n bar char, it wouldn't return two characters. It would return all four characters. Yeah. <clears throat> so the next string function is substring. And it is, we want to start at the fifth character, and we want the next five characters after that. So for this, for the first row, it's ping, which is, let's see, sleeping, S, L, E, start the fifth character, which is five, and then continue on five more, and there's a space after it, so it's ping, space. Well, do we have to always hard code those those numbers? No, we don't. We can have a uh, use a variable in them, so you could process over the result set and process different chunks of a string at a time if you wanted to, changing the variable each time you run it. I was just curious. So, can we start with? negative locations and uh, yes you can you can pass in uh, for substring you can pass in a negative start location 
and a uh, he can't pass in a negative distance. You have to pass in a positive distance. But so if we want to start at negative five, and then take the next five characters, we don't get anything because we're starting back at at the beginning, of, right before the beginning of the string. So if you do want to pass in a negative, you need to have a, uh, a distance that is greater than kind of the absolute value of what you where you're starting at on the negative scale. So that was just a little, a little thing. All right, so let's update the item skew and add on uh, padding before and padding after because sometimes when you're working with data that you're getting or data that exists already, you don't know how clean it's going to be and it could have a bunch of leading spaces, and trailing spaces. So now we're going to look at the uh, R trim and L trim string functions. Uh, this first column here is just a uh, select of the item skew, and then we get a length of that. So we know that the string itself in the database is uh, 21. But that seems kind of odd because you can see that uh, it only counted when we ran this update statement. It only put in the uh, the leading spaces. So we'll read more on that later. Uh, and then we have the next column is right trim. So we ran the R trim string function on that column. And that returned 21 as well. That's because the update did not put in uh, that trailing those trailing spaces. We can see the L trim function, next one, cleaned up those leading spaces because those were included with the update. And it string it trimmed the string down to 12 characters. So this kind of demonstrates how you can clean up uh, leading or, or trailing spaces. All right, so. Yeah. <clears throat> if you would have put something at the very end of the string after. Right, right here. Yeah. What is it? So the question was, if we if we put something in here, uh, right at the end, uh, no longer has, or what what would these these uh, trim functions do? And we we can see uh, they're no longer trimmed functions. Or sorry, the the value is no longer uh, does doesn't have leading. Or sorry, trailing spaces, and then no value. It actually has a value at the end. So it includes it <coughs> in all of the lengths. So, so let's uh, put that back. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Let me uh, get the data real fast. Blow it all away. And then put these, uh, you're never supposed to edit stuff during it at my It's okay. Good. That was a good question. All right. So, uh, I, I misspoke earlier when the update statement didn't put in the, the uh, leading zeros. Um, I remember now. It's it's the uh, the length function stops counting when it encounters trailing spaces. And I learned that when I was making this demo here. And we can prove it because the first, so we select the column out. We can see it's got the uh, leading spaces. It's not displaying the, the trailing spaces. Uh, and then that we do the, the length function, it says it's 21. But how do we know that the empty the leading spaces plus the text plus the trailing spaces uh, doesn't equal 21. And we use the replace function, which we'll cover later, uh, to see we'll replace all sp spaces with x. And we can use that to see that, yes, that, that column still has the leading spaces and the trailing spaces, and the total length is 27. So the length function itself stops counting at at uh, 
a continuate um, at a section of trailing spaces. Okay, so so I mean, how how do we clean up this data? Uh, when you you could combine the L trim and the R trim to strip off uh, trailing spaces and leading spaces. Uh, and this, all right, so upper. Is, there not, is the trim function? That uh, not that I'm aware of. Because okay, no. data should, is always clean when it comes in, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're now on to upper and lower string functions. Uh, so when does testing a various case equal testing all uppercase. Well, it's true in a case insensitive database. Here, let's, pull, let's look at our, this database we're using as uh, case insensitive. And we can see here we've got uh, a black ax. And so here's a little two second improvement. We're gonna uh, run uh, control shift U and it It'll, it'll uppercase anything you have selected. So now let's see if uh, we get the results set that we did in the previous one when the case matched. So now the case doesn't match in the description column uh, for what we're looking for, and the result is returned where the description case doesn't match. So let's, we can add on a, a collate and force a case sensitive uh, collation on this comparison right here. We don't get any results back because in the data, the description for Axe Hatchet Black is mixed case. Uh, so to, to get around that, uh, we can add the upper, put the upper string function on the table and what we're searching on, say if this is a you know variable coming in, we'll, we'll wrap upper on that again. And we'll leave the, uh, the case sensitive collation on there and see if we do get a description that matches because it put both of them kind of on, on equal ground. And it's not the most performant thing uh, to have functions on columns that you're filtering on because it can not give you the most optimal uh, query plan. Uh, and then the lower function is kind of the inverse. There is the inverse of that where it forces all alpha characters to be lowercase. And we can see that here. What's the zoom so, command again? Uh, control one. And we can see here it forced them all to lower the SBs and the LGs and the reds. We have a question that's come in that relates to the, the length of the characters, just jumping back to one section. Okay. Uh, around, is there a way to count the number of characters in a string, including the trailing white space? Uh, yes, you could. So the, uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, let's see here. Do we have our data? So if you wanted to do that, you could run uh, trailing. Yes, you could run a uh, you'd have to replace say the through a combination of replacing and I'd say probably R trim and car index to find the index the uh, the last character in the string uh, that is not a space. Uh, once you did that, then you could uh, maybe replace all. I don't know. That sounds like a good thing. one to follow up for the blog post later. Yeah, we'll have to do a, a, bo a blog post on that. Yeah. What, what is name that one? You, it, it, I, uh, Real life? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you might be able to add, if you weren't at the limit of the, uh, if it was a, a, say, a var car column, you might be able to add a character onto the end of everything and run the length of that 
Yeah, that would do um, it. Like that minus one. Yeah, that that could be a solution there. But if you're at the end of your, if your column's completely full, uh, you'd probably have to come up with a different solution for that. All right, so back to the uh, replace. We're on to the replace function. I'm sure, we all know how it works now. We've seen it a few times, uh, but what it, it takes three parameters. Uh, the first one is what you want to replace. This can be a column. Uh, it can be a character string if you want. Uh, the second parameter is control shift one. Yeah, control one. Control one. The second parameter is kind of your haystack of what you're looking for. We can see down here in the bottom, uh, since we selected out the the actual column is the first column. So we can see that we're looking for SB. It's the first parameter. If we want to replace it with SL, so for every instance of SB in the string, it will switch it with SL. And we can see that it's returned right there. So we can use that to clean up data. Like if we want to say we messed up with the SKU or we imported the, the vendor data and they have the wrong SKUs, we use SL for all our sleeping bags instead of SB. I can just have that in your update statement. And it all the data has now switched over to the uh, with SL as the leading. Is there a simple way in your replace to use like a starting, like a uh, Starting with the starting line, start yeah, starting string or ending the string. Like if I want to replace everything at the start or the end, can you use like a character to represent that? Like you couldn't throw or something, or would you have to make it complicated? So the question was, uh, is there any more parameters in this replace function to uh, represent a starter and and not with the replace? But you can nest a substring in here, right. and. Uh, with you know variables passed in, you can have it iterate through different chunks of the string. Okay. All right, now on to uh, cast and convert. Uh, they essentially they they do the same thing. Uh, first column we select out as unit retail, and then we're casting unit retail as far car, and then the the third column is converting. Uh, unit retail to var car, and we can see they return all the, the same data. Uh, the syntax is 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 flipped. Uh, convert also can take optional parameters uh, depending on the data type, and we'll get to that uh, around date. Uh, so see, we'll do the very variable date. And we will set it to get date. And we'll try to concatenate date onto some text that says get date. And we get an error message saying uh, conversion failed when converting date time and or from character string. I'm sure we all have seen that. Uh, so what you can do is you can you can do cast uh, and you'd get the uh, same results as this this first result set here. Uh, but if you use convert, you can change the formatting of it. So if you say convert uh, to a var car, uh, enter date and a one, you get you get this format here. Uh, if you say convert var car date one oh one, you get uh, the centuries or you get a extended year date on there, and if you do 120, then you get this format at the bottom here. Yep. Are there constants for those numbers? Those no. Format numbers. No. So uh, the question was, are there constants for these? Yeah, define, define. These these numbers here, and no, there is not. Uh, but there is a whole bunch of them. I just just picked three random ones, uh, just to demonstrate here. On to uh, the 2012 functions. And the first one we'll run is concat. And concat is an easy way to combine uh, fields together. 
so I don't have it written in here in the example, but to do the same conversion that in other uh, without concat, you in this first column here you need to have uh, is null. I'm gonna pick tick there. We need to have it here as well. You need to type all that stuff. You have to have pluses. Uh, and if you use the kind of explicit concatenation here or concatenation on any version prior to 2012, but with the concat function, you just have to have uh, your column columns that you want to combine and it takes care of handling is nulls and uh, what was the other one uh, and different data types so oh, if you have yeah. a float or something you don't have to cast it it'll just get yeah it worked float, out yeah it was data types so you can have bar cars in there you can have date times you can have floats and it will handle the conversion and the uh, null or not null syntax around putting those together and you can see that the uh, the output is the same. All right, and on to the, uh, the format string function. <clears throat> we have format function is also introduced in 2012. Uh, in this sample, we're going to have the the get a get date variable just kind of preset to get date, and we. The syntax is you have format, what you want to format, and then a, uh, a date or month or year. I mean, we'll get to that uh, format, I guess. And then the uh, localization. So you can see here that here's the US version, uh, month, day, year. And in Great Britain, we have they use Day, month, year. There's a whole bunch of different uh, localization values you can put in there. I just just pick one for for brevity. So on the question earlier about are there constants for those different formatting options? Well, <coughs> this string is not really a constant, but the en gb or en us is close to the standard constants that are used for specifying language codes. It's yeah, pass it as a string, not a constant. Mm -hmm. Did you try ar. <laughs> So the question is, can we try AR? Uh, is it AR, AR? Arabic. Arabic, uh, but E-N-A-R? No, I was uh, thinking uh, just the locale. There's different AR locales, but AR also is more than yeah. AR. That's so, why I was curious if you had to. So we'll try, try AR, AR. No. Oh. Let's try AR. AR. Yeah. So there we go. So it's a different calendar format. Yeah. All right. Uh, on to. I just picked some uh, different format options to review. So with capital M's, we can see four M's does March, three M's does a shorthand of March. 2Ms does the calendar number, month number, and 1M uh, just returns March 12. What about lower Ms, lowercase Ms? You can see that uh, four, 4 through 2 lowercase Ms return the minutes. So right now it's the 10.09 Pacific Standard Time. And the lower M returns March 12 again. So, not really sure what, what that is. So, now we'll repeat it with Ys. Uh, four through two capital Ys don't return anything. Uh, uppercase Y returns March 2015. And that same process with lowers returns the either four or three full years. Uh, the 15, the shorthand year, and lower Y returns March 15 again. Great question. Yeah, so, uh, oh. 
when when you're done with formatting. Okay. So. I have a question. We'll we'll say it when we're done with formatting. Uh, so capital H's uh, for hours. It's it's ten o'clock here Pacific Standard Time. So the only one that doesn't return the hour is capital H, you know, and lower H. Uh, one thing to note. The capital H returns a 24-hour clock time. Lower H is return a, uh, the 12-hour clock time. So we can't tell right now, but uh, it does that. So format, you can also format currency uh, with C, and you can localize that. Uh, the first column is that unit retail price in US dollars, and it adds on the uh, US dollar sign. Uh, when you do Great Britain, you do it concatenates on the, the pound sign. And then in Germany, does the Deutschmark? Euro. They're Euro. Oh, they're or right. Euro, yeah. They do have mark that's Euro. Yeah. All right, and formatting. You can format numbers. So I passed in this this number string one through nine, and I formatted it in like a SSN format, and it it broke it out and added the uh, hyphens in there. So here's a list of all the different characters that you can use to format. You can do placeholders, uh, decimals, groups, percentage. Uh, this will add on, I think, a mil, uh, three zeros, three or four zeros afterwards. Uh, you can do exponential formatting, just a slash for escape character. Uh, and any characters are just considered strings. Code code. I think so, yeah. All right, so we have a had a formatting question. So a couple different questions have come up. There's a lot of action in the chat window today, it seems. So uh, one of them was the follow-up question about the length and the trailing zeros, or sorry, trailing blanks. Mm -hmm. And Cody asked the question of, well, what will we call that? And I just said we'd call it like real data length, or, or sorry, real length. But after I, I realized there is a SQL Server function that covers that, it's called data length. Mm -hmm. So if you scroll back up to the length mm -hmm. function and drop in data length, uh, it, it will give you the length including uh, the trailing white space. That's the first of the two here. questions. So if you just copy that length line and put data length. Set up the, uh, the data again. Yeah. Okay. And it's data length, all caps. Well, all caps doesn't matter, but it should be data, L-E-N-G-T-H. There you go. Uh, that was one. I knew there was a way to do it, and I started googling on it uh, as it. Obviously, you couldn't do that as your training, so I was able to do that. Yeah. So the other question that came in is uh, with the concat function, uh, what is the default style conversion for concat uh, with a date? And there's a couple things around that, so we could try putting like the get date into your sure. concat. And the one thing I do know is that the format is partly based off of the collation setting for the database. So if you have a British collation versus a US English collation, you're going to get a slightly different format. But I believe. And I'm going to scroll up here and do this control one. Let's see here. The concat combined is what we're looking at there. So yeah, we added on the concat. And this is the the format right there. So if you wanted to use the concat with a different format, you could use the format function to reformat the date and put that inside as a parameter on the concat. I think that covers all the open questions at okay. this point. Cool function. Yeah. Concat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the format. Oh, yeah. How was that in 2012? Then? 
Correct. Yes, it was added in 2012. Uh, so now, just kind of cover some bonus things. Uh, it was it was in the chapters we we read. Uh, so there's server property, and you can pass in uh, these uh, strings. Product version, server property returns uh, 2012. You can see there. Product level, uh, RTM, and edition. So we're running on a developer edition. Uh, and then, so how about finding kind of SQL Server properties on a specific object, like a function or a table? Uh, there's a table in the system, uh, sys.objects, and that has every single object that you've created in the system. We can see here on the description column, system table, internal table, user table, which are, means that a user created the table, uh, primary key, internal table. So let's filter it down to our inventory table. You don't need the, the schema on the front there. So we can see now we have an object ID. So we can just select that object ID and get that. And then run the, uh, the is Microsoft shipped. We can tell that uh, it, it's when it returns a zero, that means that a user created it. Uh, if it returns a one for that object name or object ID, sorry, then that means that it came uh, with the SQL server. That a quick way to get uh, the object ID instead of you know running one select to get the number and then pulling it out and running the object property, uh, you can just select an object ID and pass in a name, and then you can nest that in the object property to get your uh, the same result there. And the handy query is a selecting from the sys object where the object property for that object ID column uh, and then checking if it's Microsoft, making sure Microsoft shipped is zero so we can see all the user defined or user created functions or objects in the database. So you can use that to kind of keep track of new things that are added. Um, you could maybe do some logging to see if things were removed. Yep. So the object ID function just returns the object ID column from the sys.object table? Correct. Because uh, I know I've used it before, like creating schema, right? If exists, mm -hmm. um, object ID of stored proc, drop the proc, right? And then create proc kind of deal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I didn't realize that's uh, how it's tied together. Yeah, it all relates back to the, uh, the sys objects table. So then, um, information schema sys dot objects and sys objects. Is sys objects kind of deprecated now, and people just haven't adopted the, the ANSI information schema stuff, or you know what I'm saying on that? Like, yeah, I, there's various kind of table tables to look at the data. So, but just a side note on what you were saying on if you're checking for a stored procedure, for instance, mm -hmm. see if it exists, say if object ID of the name of that stored procedure. I think you give this procedure and say comma something type, right? Or right, something. right. You want to make sure you include the type on that because if you don't, you end up, uh, you could have a table that's named the same thing as a stored procedure mm -hmm. and it could say, yes, the table exists and you try and drop the stored, drop yeah. it. Yeah, drop the table. You, you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You could even query this this table or you know wherever the objects are located on the name, the scheme ID, and uh, and the type if you had the same object name and multiple schemas. So um, you may have covered it on the concat. Is that a preferred thing to just operators like with the pluses and stuff now? Uh, it, I had to it. on SQL Server 2012 or newer. Absolutely. It's a lot safer and you're less likely to run into the is null situation you would with just building it out with pluses. 
Uh, but if you're running code that needs to run in SQL Server 2008 R2 or older, you can't use it at that point. Yeah. 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 And it, the concat handles data type conversions. And if you have a date time in here, then that's just mm -hmm. another convert you know, to yeah. date to var car. It's just uh, a lot cleaner and yeah, it can keep you safe from data type conversion errors. Right. And then that's that's it for me. Any, any questions? Uh, you you were talking about how the case sensitive collation affects comparing strings for equality. Mm -hmm. um, does that also affect how the replace function compares strings and finds matches? Uh, I'm not sure on that one. I'll have to look that one up. Yes. <clears throat> yes. If it's a case insensitive database, uh, the replace function will find all of the occurrences independent of case. But if it's a case sensitive database, it will find only those that are a case match. That's right, guess, but it can't prove it. So. so if I can jump in here for a minute. Sure. Uh, there's one thing. Nice thing about doing this training every week is we all learn something. And I think uh, there was one of the things that Gabe pointed out that I misstated as we went through on the cursor's point. Uh, and I appreciate that input. But let me show you what, what it was that I said that was not quite right. Uh, on the cursors, one of the things that I stated was that when you just declare a cursor, like what we've got here, select cursor four. Now, I said the four refers to for this next thing. It's not that that is optional and if you don't specify anything on the cursor uh you it's assuming that it's going to be a forward only cursor uh, i i stated that it was going to be a scrolling cursor but it assumes that it's going to be a forward only cursor not a fast forward cursor so it's still going to be slow if you don't specify that but it's not as slow as if you said it's going to be a scrolling cursor so uh, having the time to look that up on the side while Aaron was presenting, I was able to get that the right answer there. So uh, a cursor is not scrolling by default, but it is forward only, not fast forward. So any other questions coming in on, on there? I don't see any more questions. But any questions? About a minute delay. Questions on anyone in the room from anything <laughs> we've covered today? So that SP for each database, is that a safe thing to use or will they take it away since it's not documented? Uh, the question is for the SPMS for each DB function, is it safe to use? Well, any, undocument, any undocumented function is never entirely safe to use because you're right, it could go away in the next version. But it's been there for many versions and uh, it's just one of those you just need to be aware that it, it could go away if you're using it. Uh, it'd be different if you're using it like in a maintenance plan on a local database rather than in a shipping product where it went out to thousands of customers, for instance. So, yeah, the, part of the danger of any undocumented function is that it could change or go away, and that's the reason they don't document them. So, you Good point. I have a question. What's the um, question? Is it true that in the real world, one rarely, if ever, needs cursors? So the question was, is it true that in the real world, one rarely, if ever, needs cursors? Well, uh, it really depends a lot on what you're doing, but 99% of the time in my career with SQL Server, whenever a cursor comes up, uh, there's always been another way of doing it. And sometimes you can do that with a join using set logic. Sometimes you can do it uh, with a CTE. Sometimes you can do it with a temp table. But 99% of the time, I have been able to eliminate cursors by doing it some other way that's usually far, far more efficient than uh, using a cursor. And the only example I can think of in the last several years that I've been stuck with a cursor that I couldn't find a more efficient way of doing it was with calculating uh, millions and millions of prime numbers where uh, not, not your typical data type functionality there. Any other questions come up that we missed? Uh, I haven't seen any more questions. Okay. Well, next, uh, next week, uh, March 19th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, we're going to be covering uh, time functions, logical functions, and then user-defined functions. So rather than just using these functions that we've been given, how do we go build our own? And for more information, visit emergencyreporting.com to find out more about our company. 
Uh, visit Aaron on the web at AaronBuma.com or on Twitter as Aaron D. Buma or me on the web at stevesedman.com or Twitter SQL EMT. That wraps it up for today. Leave that up for like a minute or so. Yeah, we'll leave it open just for a moment. I think we've, we've been long enough since we asked for questions. Okay. Hopefully. Uh, if anybody has any questions that we've missed, feel free to just follow up with me afterwards. Uh, thanks for joining us today.